Be right back, Tim. Don't worry, don't panic. Hey, can everyone see me? Yep. Yes, Alex, and let them clear. Hey, cool, great. Um, hey, we'll we'll be about to start. Maybe maybe the, now's a good time. Was the video flickering? No, it's okay. 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 Cheers. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to our fourth panel on the poly crisis, and it's now been a whole year since we started. So um, it's our one year birthday. So Kate, Kate and I started Polycrisis about a year ago to in investigate the intersections in the world crisis that we are living in. And if you're here, you know, you, like us, you're absolutely fascinated by oil and politics, energy and machines, money and minerals. Um, and we have been sort of chasing up those stories and seeing where they go. We are hosted and edited by the wonderful team at Phenomenal World, Jack Sinoja, Emma, who published the best political economy content hands down. And I hope you've been, you've been reading um, all of us together. So this panel we um, have organized on the climate crisis and so social Democrats, the world over share a diagnosis of the climate crisis. They say that the wealthiest create CO2 through consumption, through controlling the means of production and corralling democratic forces. And the solutions that have been offered create powerful, powerful enemies. And this has been our diagnosis of the planetary impasse that we have found ourselves in. And this panel is to look at the energy transition, which is in its chaotic, messy phase. Um, and we have um, gotten together a group of wonderful experts um, and to, to guide us through it. Everyone, it now seems, is interested in energy security. For me, energy security basically meant having the lights on growing up as a kid in Bombay in India, where the lights were off more often than not. Um, so it seems like maybe just getting a diesel generator is energy security. But I think we are, we are far, far beyond that phase now, where energy security means uh, statesmen plotting war on gas-rich, oil-rich, countries, um, fights over pipelines, a lot of things blowing up in our face. Um, so we, um, the panelists that we have assembled here are Amy Myers Jaffe. She is currently the director of the Energy, Climate Justice and Sustainability Lab at NYU. William Oman is an economist at the IMF who works on um, climate change and macrofinancial issues. And he's the author of a new paper on the on the mid transition, uh, which is a concept um, created by Emily Grubert and Sarah Hastings Simon. Uh, we have Alex Turnbull, who's a fund manager based in Singapore and, and works with researchers at the ANU. And he's been modeling everything from China's domestic coal capacity to solar PV to hydrogen. Um, and next we have Morgan Bazilian, who's the director of the Payne Institute and a professor of public policy at uh, the Colorado School of Mines. Um, and um, last, we have uh, our moderator, Adam Tooz, um, who's a professor of history at Columbia and the director of uh, the European Institute and really doesn't need any introduction. Over to you, Adam. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. And it really is a delight to be here. And thank you to you, to Kate, to the entire JFI Phenomenal World Polycrisis blog team, because you enrich our lives um, every day. It's really been a privilege to be in conversation with you folks over the last couple of years and a delight to be here. Um, yeah, the, the theme of the panel could hardly be uh, more topical. Um, in the brief that you folks assembled for us, we're talking about the um, we're fa a world facing something completely new, which will be terminally declining oil demand, a world which is now actually embarking on uh, an energy transition in various messy, incomplete, but nevertheless highly dynamic ways. And our task for today is to begin digging into the questions that arise from this for the realm of geopolitics, for the realm of international relations and the relations between states. 
And some of the questions that immediately arise were, were prefaced by you for, for the panel. How do we think about who the winners and the losers are going to be? What are the prospects for various types of mineral exporting countries? How does a world with a terminally declining oil demand look? What kind of games get played out along that curve? Um, what is the future? What does the future of a more distributed energy system look like? One which doesn't rely on the sort of hunter-gatherer model of discovering fossil fuel reserves, but instead is centered on farming, wind and uh, solar power. And getting into the, the group, the weeds, um, what what do we make of the, the shock? I think we have to speak now of an EV shock. This is happening as fast as anyone anticipated it could possibly happen. And in very dramatic ways, driven, of course, by by China. And how do we imagine uh, a world of a new genre, a new generation of EV centered um, subsidies playing out? So an incredibly interesting range of questions. I'm not going to narrow our wonderful panel down in any way. I'm just going to simply ask um, A.B. Morgan, William and Alex in that order to open things up, picking one of these questions or other questions which seem to you to be salient. And then we'll go back and forth. In terms of bringing in questions from the audience, uh, to my mind, the easiest way to do this is by chat. Is chat enabled? Can we do that on chat? Um, um, if so, that would be great. We can pile them there and I can feed them into the conversation. But otherwise, um, I'd say, Amy, take it away. Well, listen, uh, thanks, Adam. And uh, thanks to JFI and the Poly Crisis team for putting this together. It's really just such a pleasure to be here with. Uh, some of the greatest minds and thinking about the intersection between multiple things that seem disconnected. Adam, you and I uh, spend a lot of time looking at the intersection between climate change, banking crisis, uh, and oil prices. Um, and so I thought I would kind of start there a little bit just to talk a little bit about um, the cycle. You know, big fan of Emily Grubert's concept that we're somehow uh, starting to build out the new energy system, but we haven't integrated it or, or figured out how to get it to work well with the old energy system. And, uh, and, and I would say that oil demand itself is not going to fall evenly. So there's still a lot of places where oil demand is rising. Um, uh, big debate on Twitter today about whether U.S. gasoline demand is going up or down. And I think the trend has been, you know, that it peaked a few years ago. But but the bottom line is, as we move forward, you know, it doesn't matter what the snapshot is, this 15 seconds, because we have these technologies and they're pretty readily deployable, um, oil has become less inelastic than it's been in the past. And, you know, what do I mean by that for uh, some of our listeners that, you know, aren't studying economics? So, you know, in the past, there have been some functions for oil, especially in vehicles, um, but also in certain petrochemical sectors and other sectors where there was no substitute for oil. And therefore, prices could go way up um, and they would stay there for some period of time until somebody drilled for more oil um, because there wasn't a ready thing you could do. Um, but today, with the sort of digital world, and that can be everything from I'm owning a, an EV. I could not own an EV, but if there's no gasoline available, maybe um, maybe somebody else who has an EV would be able to pick me up with a ride sharing service. Um, and so we have these ways now that as individuals and, and as communities, we can actually move away from oil and we know what they are and the technologies that exist. Um, we can use e-commerce and then some giant deliverer um, who has uh, maybe also might have some kind of electrified vans or might um, have access or they're going to pay the diesel fuel, but they have an optimization program. So they're going to use less fuel to bring me goods. We have all these new ways of organizing ourselves. And even though gasoline prices are still and fuel prices are still in front of people's face um, when they go very high, I think that people are going to start to learn that they have these alternatives. Um, so, but we have this problem, which I think is the today's crisis problem, you know, besides the war itself and all the negative 
uh, things that come about from that. Not the first rodeo here for um, a, 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 an oil producer amassing some revenue um, and then using it to attack a neighboring country. You know, this is a pattern we've seen over and over and over again in this commodity. Um, and and we need to be mindful that there is this link with banking crises that sometimes comes about because of uh, the availability of money and the interest rate and the value of the dollar. Um, and we're seeing that cycle um, that we saw back in 2007, 2008, and in prior years, back in the 70s, where we're now at the 50th anniversary, uh, coming up October 19th or 20th, depending on what you want to count as the original day. Um, we're still not out of the woods on the fact that if OPEC plus gets it wrong and they pick a hot price that's too high and we, we can't damp down the inflationary pressures, um, that the high interest rates are going to crash the housing market in different locations. We already have problems in China, in the real estate end and in the banking side. So if we have more contagion, we already saw some problems in the U.S. banking sector. Uh, Europe sort of dodged a bullet in their banking sector. But, you know, we could see a return of a pretty dire picture um, if if we don't sort of get this right. And there's sort of a time lag because if the price of oil is high, more people buy an EV, more people do other things. Um, uh, but, you know, there's that time lag that Emily Gruber talks about in her article from the moment in time at which people decide that they're going in a different direction because oil or liquefied natural gas is too expensive and the time that the infrastructure uh, turns over to something else. So I think I'll stop there. I just want to make one point as because I know we're going to delve into metals. Um, so I'd like to make this point that always gets skimmed over uh, before I stop, which is that when you put a metal in my vehicle or in my uh, virtual power plant battery and solar panel setup, um, I'm going to have it there probably for a decade. And then after the end of the decade, uh, especially now, because we're talking 10 years from now, I'm going to be able to recycle it. And you've got not only did the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act give billions of dollars out for recycling of metals, but you've got VTOL and some of the big commodity traders uh, investing in recycling of metals. So, but not only does it stay there for 10 years, uh, there's this thing where people want to somehow make it like a moral equivalency that, you know, China controls these assets for processing, or there's a lot of resource in this country or that country that's metals. And I just want to make the point that it's not the same as oil and gas, because you don't burn it in one minute, and then it's gone forever and you need new materials, yeah. right? And so we need to move away from that storyline, which I do believe is a very oil industry oriented storyline, that somehow these metals are just as bad. Um, and I'm not saying that the metals don't have some environmental impacts that need serious consideration, um, but it's really a very different kind of thing. But the one thing that's similar is people said we were going to run out of lithium. Um, and then, of course, now we're just getting these giant announcements that there's been a world historic find of lithium in India, and it's so much lithium that they're not going to need to import lithium from any place else. And now we're having the same statement about a lithium mine that's you know been around for a while, or deposit uh, on the Oregon-Nevada uh, border. So like oil, I think these metals will suddenly appear um, in ways we didn't imagine they would, um, because it's a commodities market, and uh, commodities have a way of showing up when somebody needs them. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking us into metals, oil, and finance all in one fell swoop. Um, Morgan, um, which bit of this subject do you want to pick up for us? Lovely. Uh, thank you, Adam. And thanks to uh, Tim and, and, and the team um, for, for having me on this uh, uh, august panel. Um, I think I think I'll just I'll, I'll say five things. So as if I'm a as if I'm a McKinsey consultant, I, I, I'm new to the academy. I've spent my career in public service, most recently at the World Bank, um, and most of that time I've 
been working on some area of energy security and now more recently on uh, mineral criticality. Um, so the, the first thing is, is that in 2008, I wrote one of the only textbooks that's been written on energy security. It has the catchy title of uh, Analytical Methods for Energy Diversity and Security. It's not sold as well as any of Adam's books. Um, it was published in 2008. In 2008, in the second paragraph of the introduction, we warned about the dependence of Europe on Russian natural gas. It was obvious then there were meetings of ministers happening all over 2008, 2009 about transit through Ukraine. Uh, it remained obvious. Um, and the, the other pieces of that energy security um, analytical methods were, were mostly around diversity of supply at that time. And, you know, since then, we've moved to much more sophisticated ways to look at energy security and to things like demand and even um, institutions, governance, uh, markets, et cetera. Um, the, the second thing I'll say is we wrote a paper, um, it was published in Nature, that's something that academics say, that um, was a result of a scenario exercise we did for the German government. It was not the German Department of Energy or Economics, as it were, but the the, the Ministry at uh, of Security and, and, and sort of anonymous with State Department a little bit. And in it, we, we came up with four different scenarios, wildly um, different outcomes uh, of things like oil versus, say, renewable energy, or we included other fossil fuels and different kinds of energy. I guess the, the most important uh, outcome there was that we said, you know, the important thing is... Um, that there will be winners and losers, and 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 that that was published, I guess, about four years ago. The other thing, though, that I think is more poignant for policymakers is that we said it's important to make plans. It's very easy, politically expedient, to make goals, and we see that all the time. We now have many of the world's powers, maybe most, with say net zero climate goals. Uh, in fact, Russia brought their net zero goal to the climate talks six weeks before uh, this invasion of Ukraine. And so one can be rather cynical about the value of, of um, making high level, level political statements. Um, the planning is, is extraordinarily difficult uh, to not just the politics, but the engagement with communities and the funding of it. Um, the third thing I'll say is we wrote a piece where we tried to look at security uh, in, in a different way. It, it was written during COVID. Um, and we, we, turn, we, we, I think we coined the term actorless threats in that piece. And, and actorless threats was, was um, a way to look at how you move from at least in the US from a military Carter doctrine perspective on security towards something where there's no one to, or no jurisdiction or no place to, to, to put military force per se. In other words, there's nowhere to target a missile. Um, and though the examples we gave were, were the COVID, uh, uh, the pandemic and, and climate change. Um, the fourth thing, is uh, critical minerals. We uh, at the School of Mines have the best mining engineering department, we think, in the world, at least in the United States, um, in case our Aussie uh, counterpart uh, uh, finds that offensive. Um, that, uh, you know, the straw man that we have to make an analogy between oil security and mineral criticality is long disbanded, but a, a couple of the things in the critical mineral space that are important to keep in mind are that one, 
it is true that China dominates the space and the United States is not going to catch up in the in the very short term. Uh, mostly not just because China's planned for this over the last three decades, but because they're not waiting for us to catch up. They're in fact making enormous investments today in those spaces. Uh, the second part of that is that you have to think across supply chains and critical minerals. No one actually needs the, the raw minerals themselves. Uh, and the value add for the economy goes up as you move along the value chain to advanced uh, manufacturing. And that markets, uh, the markets for these different things, whether you think of critical minerals as 18 things as the, in the recent DOE list or 50 things in the USGS list or some other list, um, each of those markets is very different. And in most cases, they're minute, they have very poor price signals and they're not liquid. And, and those are significant um, threats. So those are not technical challenges. There's, as has been said, there's plenty of the stuff and on the earth, um, but there are challenges. Um, when we looked at different ways to consider security, we, we published a piece that looked at six new ways to, to define a new energy security. We included critical minerals, but the other ones uh, aren't as maybe readily uh, considered. So we said data science, justice and equity, a shift in capital priorities, and resilience in supply chains, and finally cybersecurity. So we defined it in a completely different way than it previously had been. And the final thing I'll say is that um, at, at the Institute, I have the honor to run at, at, at a small public university. Um, we have one of the best uh, capabilities on satellite data. And that satellite data, um, we basically see light and we impute heat. In other words, we calculate heat through basic equations of physics. And through that, we have really a, a very different way to look at how energy security uh, and national security and human security are, are, are being um, reshaped. And that is long the, been the purview, at least in the US of the intelligence community and the military. And now those functions are well, as an example, at a, at a public university in Colorado. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Morgan. That was, that was fascinating. Um, so, William, I'll call on you and then Alex, and then we'll, we'll start going back and forth. Thanks, Adam. And thanks to uh, Tim and Kate for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this panel. Uh, the usual disclaimer applies that the views I'll uh, share are mine and not those of the IMF, its executive board, or its management. Uh, that being said, I think um, uh, Amy and Morgan's interventions uh, uh, provided a uh, good background for uh, me to segue into this <clears throat> discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts that are mainly related to our paper that you mentioned in the beginning uh, with uh, co-authors from uh, the World Bank, uh, the French Central Bank in academia, and then I'll share uh, a couple more general thoughts. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, talk in the uh, early part of this discussion on winners and losers. And I think what we tried to... Um, focus on in our paper is that there's been a lot of focus in uh, policy discussions on the ways in which geoeconomic fragmentation and geopolitical rivalry matter for the prospects of global decarbonization, but there's been much less focus on the potential impact of global decarbonization on uh, geoeconomic fragmentation and geopolitical rivalry, so the, the other way around, so to speak. And so, as was mentioned, we build on this concept uh, developed by um, Grubert and Hastings Simon of the mid transition, which we interpret as a volatile, unstable, and potentially chaotic period, uh, a, a transitory period, where we have simultaneously the persistence of the fossil based energy system and the rise of low carbon technologies. And I wouldn't say a low carbon energy system at this point, I would say low carbon technologies. And <clears throat> What we take from this is that, um, so 
we have some modeling results that show very large uh, changes in energy exports, trade balances, and GDP among G20, G20 countries at the 2030, 2040, and 2050 horizon. Uh, but one of the main conclusions of our paper uh, is more of a qualitative nature that the world economy may be entering this mid-transition, uh, unstable, uh, transitory phase. And this is happening even as climate uh, impacts and other impacts of the poly crisis uh, worsen. And in this context, um, there, is a, there is a real risk of the world economy being increasingly exposed uh, to cross-border risks of, a, of an economic and financial nature, uh, which would actually um, <clears throat> deepen fragmentation. And this could ultimately disrupt national economies, global trade, and potentially even the international monetary and financial system. And that would in turn interfere with countries' uh, ability to decarbonize. Um, and so we uh, outlined this risk of a, a potential, what we call a mid-transition trap. And um, just broadening a bit the, the lens here, um, I think uh, in terms of winners and losers, there was, the, you know, there's a, there's this this um, ongoing conversation about the 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 implications of ongoing dynamics uh, across countries across the world, and I think our paper helps to think about these questions uh, on three different levels. The first is at the domestic level, so we outline these um, country archetypes: fossil fuel exporters and importers, uh, uh, clean technology exporters and importers, and critical mineral exporters. So we have these five different archetypes, and these archetypes show that resources matter, but other factors, in particular countries' production and consumption patterns, their technological uh, capabilities um, to produce lower carbon technologies, and their ability to produce uh, renewable energies. Uh, also matter. So it's not just a question of resources and uh, geographical determinism. And at the international level, the dynamic relations among these country archetypes can be uh, helpful, thinking through the dynamic relations uh, among and, and between various uh, country archetypes, because of course, countries will not fall neatly onto one specific archetype. Um, so this is something where I, I think our paper can can uh, can uh, help think through these these possible cross border risks. And finally, I'd like to broaden um, the discussion a bit. The in my view, the uh, focus on winners and losers is somehow uh, missing a very big blind spot, which is that we're facing a huge uh, collective action trap uh, related to political economy. Neither the middle classes in high income economies nor uh, the majority of developing economies have the means uh, in the current international institutional configuration to achieve the transition. So we're seeing the simultaneous occurrence of significant costs related to climate policies and um, a straitjacket and rules of the game that, that prevent a lot of countries from, uh, from actually achieving uh, a rapid transition. And I think the risk is that this uh, this could give rise to a significant political backlash with the rise of uh, populist and extremist parties. And I think we've already seen this recently in Germany over the summer with the uh, the um, the uh, regional elections where uh, that were won by AfD, the far right party. Also, the U-turn uh, of Rishi Sunak, so more the center right party in the UK. I think could be an illustration of this. And there are numerous. Um, other illustrations of this double bind, where countries are uh, countries are, are are faced by double bind. We had recent uh, uh, news reports on Brazil that's looking into uh, oil exploration off uh, the the coast of the Amazon, the, the the mouth of the Amazon, which could make uh, Brazil the number four oil producer in the world. So major major implications. And the official rhetoric by the energy minister was we need to eradicate poverty in Brazil, and this needs to be financed. So I think this is a major uh, blind spot in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the global policy discussion. Um, so yeah, let me stop here. William, thank you so much. And the paper is absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, it's really this whole mid-transition issue is one that we, we have got to come back to. Alex, um, can I ask you to wrap up this first round of comments and panelists all please start thinking about how you want to respond to each other's interventions um but alex um, looking forward to hearing from you sure thanks adam um i i guess what i've been modeling with the anu is some of the i guess details of these mid-transition dynamics <clears throat> particularly with respects to china uh, china is in some respects 
far more advanced in um, activities like stockpiling, though they are loath to um, disclose these things extensively, which is leads to some interesting um, forensic econometric work. Um, and there's also the issue with China is that much like uh, a lot of a lot of other countries, and particularly the US, it is a large domestic producer of a lot of both fossil commodities, but also newer energy products. <clears throat> so the issue is, is that you can have this very turbulent dynamic where a country can previously be a large importer of things and then make a very rapid phase shift to self-sufficiency, both policy-led and, and just due to changes in dyna demand dynamics. And this, of course, has you know, very big macro implications for anyone who trades with China and commodities. So we've been modeling how China's been reconfiguring its internal logistics to essentially exit uh, coal markets rather quickly, how their changes in grid investments could lead to that happening a lot faster than um, many people expect, and certainly consensus modeling. And uh, yeah, and also tr trying to pick apart what, what exactly China does with its strategic petroleum reserve, which is um, unlike the EIA, not helpfully reported every week. Um, so that there's a there's a, there's a there's a confluence of both the um, complexity of the strategies countries produce, uh, engage in, how quickly that happens depending on technology and their investment practices, and then also really deep opacity, which makes it very harder for other countries to coordinate their behaviour. Uh, and so it, it is, I think, this mid transition is almost in physics. It's like sort of a phase shift. It's a little bit unpredictable and um, non-linear and leads to very peculiar dynamics where Europe can be absolutely hurting for gas one year and then swimming in it the next year. Um, so it's it's a volatile time. It's interesting, of course, from an investing point of view, um, but actually trying to really pull this apart is, and particularly this, this sort of, this mid-transition is very different to what most equilibrium can we get to net zero 2050 modeling does whereby you project out say fit to 2050 in steps of 10 years these shorter periods of what like what happens in the next three to five years is um uh, to me is a lot more fascinating both from a work point of view but also in the sense that it's incredibly volatile non-linear and these impacts seem to happen in very um uh, strange ways, and often it's, at least for China, the disclosure is not excellent, which makes it very hard for other countries to coordinate their behaviours. Uh, and so in, in, the, in the stockpiling work, um, I've actually been inspired by China's State Reserve Board behaviours as to how um, countries outside China can better achieve sort of a smoother supply growth of these critical transition minerals um, because having worked on about, I think, seven lithium bankruptcies over the last 12, 15 years, um, quite clearly the way we manage this in the West has not been uh, optimal. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for that, that insight and that perspective from the market. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to you all with my kind of historian's hat on and tempted to paraphrase Keynes that. I don't know. In the long run, are we always going to be in the mid transition? Like, do we, I mean, what, what, especially if one picks up on William's point about mid transition trap, the sort of, and, and Alex, your comments at the end between about the difference between actual short run, medium term analysis, which is presumably what your bread and butter is and what you live and die by. And the rather more notional 10 by 10, decade by decade, planning out to 2050. I can understand why we need transition thinking. What I'm really puzzled by is the idea of the mid. I, 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 I don't, I, that seems to me a teleological construction, which implies that we know that we actually get there. Whereas everything you, Alex, in fact, all of you are basically saying is the transition we're embarking on is so turbulent in its implications there are so many obvious points of resistance. Tim flagged these up at the beginning. There are very heavily invested and dug in powerful interests which see the transition coming a mile away, 50 years, 30 years away, and can, can act on that. 
And as you're saying, William, like the in fact what's overwhelming in the current moment are the constraints. And what you're saying, Alex, is that financial market actors are all making decisions on a horizon which is far shorter. And in that, on that far shorter time horizon, the the TD, you know, the direction of travel is just not so obvious. Hey, Adam, can I weigh in here with please, an example? Please, 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 cheer me I, up. I Talk absolutely me. love how you framed it because I think you've really super clarified down, you know, down to the nub of the nub. And uh, and I wanted to throw out an example from the state of California, which I think is a local uh, locus that um, has is further along in the so-called mid transition than many other locations, even China, because even though China, as Morgan so correctly points out, has been plotting this line for themselves uh, for decades with industrial policy, five year plans, giant amount of public finance. Um, they're still highly dependent on coal. They're still one of the largest world's importers of oil. They're buying LNG from the United States, even though we have a complicated relationship. They, they're the ones who ponied up even more uh, for the new LNG terminals than the Europeans. So California seems to me a microcosm of what can go right and what can go wrong. And I want to give an example that no one really thinks about uh, that kind of involved me, uh, still involves me, because even though I'm not 100% working on that now, people still <laughs> involve me. So I was put on a panel in California, like a January 6th committee about gasoline prices appointed by the government, right? And I had to do, th I don't know, two years, three years of hearings. And and one of the things that comes about in the mid transition, of course, is that companies have to take, as Alex and you have correctly pointed out, you know, companies take different strategies. You know, maybe they also did a model of what they think is coming in 30 years, but they might have done a model for the next two years and they have to decide what to do. And that's influenced by what they're forced to do by policy. So California has this policy, uh, which you know seems to be quite effective in terms of implementation, the low carbon fuel standard, where uh, fuel providers have to show a increasing decarbonization or they have to buy carbon credits and those are gonna get more expensive over time and the cap is gonna come down over time. And then of course, California also has the broader cap and trade market. And, What's actually happened in California is that the California, one more little detail to make it easier to follow, California is a weird gasoline market because theoretically you could bring gasoline from Singapore or some other location, but it's very, there's a limited number of ways you can bring it in by pipeline in the United States, which is what the way most fuel moves around. So they're a little bit island nation in the sense that if a refinery breaks or something goes wrong, it has an instant um, price impact temporarily while you figure out whether you can make money bringing in an import. And what happened in California is that a few of the refinery players have realized that as people close, there's this race between who's left with monopoly power or, or, or market power, maybe monopoly is too strong a word, who's left with market power that are the remaining refiners versus how fast can the government get people into electric cars and other kinds of transport solutions so that the lack of refining or the shrinking of refining won't matter. Um, and you know the whole thing has blown up into this political scandal about this premium for gasoline prices in California um, that really outpaces the rest of the country, which is not really a direct result of carbon pricing or anything like that, but is sort of a symptomology of the mid-transition because you have had refinery closures. Uh, there is market power. Um, it's hard for the government to get people into electric cars. And, um, and you have this sort of mismatch where there is no, I mean, are we going to say that the refineries are utilities now and we're not going to let them shut until there's enough people to move? And then as Morgan so correctly points out, there's a justice issue because are we going to have it be that people who are wealthy and have electric cars or have other means of transportation, Uber and whatever, are going to be fine? 
but people who have an old vehicle that needs gasoline are the ones who are going to get really socked with this very high uh, gasoline price. So I can kind of see this landscape coming forward in California. And, uh, and even though they're farther ahead on electric car deployment and farther ahead on renewable energy, you know, percentage in, of the system and doing really well with batteries and they didn't have a blackout and so and so and so, mm -hmm. you could still see this mismatch coming where you have this power struggle between the government of California and the refining industry about what the path forward is. Thank you so much. Uh, um... Willem, I was kind of hope William, I was kind of hoping to provoke you on this score. Um, like when you think when you talk about your mid-transition trap, I mean, how deep is that trap? Uh, and does it put in question the, you know, the ultimate telos? I mean, because the the mid-transition concept just has this incredibly strong teleological implication that we can actually define the middle. To me, it's a little bit like the interregnum idea, which floats around critical political economy, that we're between you know, hegemonic structures. And I always am tempted to ask what convinces you that there's another one coming? Um, why, so, you, so so do you, do you, in your, in your modeling, are you, does the, does the mid-transition trap, how destabilizing is it to the overall narrative of transition? Is it more a marginal thing that like floats off to the side? Because there was also a paper in Nature which modeled a situation where North America basically just floats off into a protectionist, you know, fossil fossil fuel protected zone. But sorry, and uh, go with it. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Uh, great question. I think um, that what we, the way we interpret the mid transition is actually uh, more as a transitory phase that. It's not an, a transition in the traditional sense of <clears throat> decarbonization uh, policy discussions, where decarbon where transition means basically a controlled trajectory of the global economy to decarbonize with a, on a certain timeline with a certain shape of the curve that implies a certain number of, uh, you know quantity of emissions, and so we interpret it in a slightly different way of this volatile, unstable, and potentially even chaotic transitory phase. Uh, characterized by the persistence of fossil based uh, the fossil based energy system and the rise of certain very important low carbon uh, technologies and i think the the the, um, the the mid transition concept is is not some sort of afterthought but is actually um uh very important in our paper in the sense that we really see the risk of a trap because of numerous uh cross border feedback loops that we identify in the country to to give you one example um, we have a materialization of physical risks, uh, for example, in Latin America on hydropower that directly leads to a buildup of fossil infrastructure uh, to, to, to offset that. We also have sovereign, uh, sovereign debt crises that have multiple sources um, and, and external debt crises that directly lead to uh, inflow of FDI into uh, extractive sectors. We have huge uh, gas project in Argentina, Vaca Muerta at the moment. And so all of this has uh, very significant biophysical and biogeochemical implications that the climate crisis will continue to be fueled by all this. And so we have both the, the cross-border feedback loops on an economic and financial level uh, between uh, energy, uh, trade, um, sovereign, and financial uh, channels. And we also have in the background um, these uh, biophysical dynamics going on that are, uh, in principle, irreversible, contrary to the, the crises that we're all used to thinking about the Great Depression and so on, where uh, things are, are largely dependent on social conventions, uh, social constructs, uh, you know, financial uh, problems that, that can be reversed, which is not the case with the ongoing uh, <clears throat> planetary boundary, uh, 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 planetary boundaries being crossed. And so I think this idea of a trap that we outline uh, is quite important in the paper because it uh, it, it implicitly highlights the enormous collective action trap that we find ourselves in. And that's why I think there's a blind spot on this discussion about winners and losers, because we will all be losers in an absolute sense if the current um, configuration persists, because we will um, uh, we are likely to see these, these very significant binding constraints uh, materialize both on, um, on resources, 
um, on um, um, you know on the supply chains, but also this more uh, uh, difficult to pin down political economy factor that I uh, mentioned earlier. And so I think the the policy implications are really you know it's become a bit of a cliche to talk about international cooperation and coordination, but the this can uh, this can be very concrete uh, in terms of metals and minerals. Do we need an international agency? Uh, we don't have one at the moment. We have the IEA, we have the World Bank, we have IRENA that all are kind of jockeying uh, for leadership on uh, on international cooperation on 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 minerals, on supply and prices. But I think this uh, this can be uh, translated into very concrete uh, um, uh, very concrete policy agenda. Um, for international cooperation. And of course, the, the context of geopolitical rivalry, of course, China, US in particular, makes this extremely difficult. But I think this has to be a working hypothesis and a, a, a kind of a working hypothesis for a policy agenda, because at the moment, I don't see this being part of, uh, you know, uh, at the center of, of policy discussions. Mm. Mm. Thank you. I mean, in the markets, Alex, do you see a kind of solid conviction around the 2050 60 70 kind of horizon is that is that there or do you see the markets pricing for some sort of mixed and as a result very unstable environment i i i think it's um <laughs> no one cares about 2050 um no, no a, yeah. <laughs> i mean sorry that's like it's <laughs> not that's not that's not how uh in bond yeah, markets uh, maybe right uh no, not good. really. Well, I no. think the question is: Are people making capital investments today with their eye out in a distance, or only on the next couple of years? I, I mean, I'll give you an example. It, it is it is very hard, for example, to fund pumped hydro assets right now because they are five to seven year capital works projects, which are predicated whose economics are predicated upon. Uh, diurnal price cycling spreads. So the good news is, is that batteries have gotten a lot cheaper and there's a number of other sort of more modular long-term energy storage options. So in Australia, we're, we're sort of seeing the, this mid-transition get to a good place. So during the Ukraine sh uh, shock, prices, electricity prices moved in sympathy with you know, fuel costs, namely coal and gas. But we've now had so many people install solar and also utility, but also primarily residential. And now we've got enough battery supply going in, gas burns in the Australian grid are probably gonna drop by 50, 60%. And what that does from an industrial organization point of view is that Australia is a little bit like Canada. It can, it's sort of not a, as big and competitive a country as the United States. So it gets a little bit clubby and people tend to extract rents and engage in portfolio bidding. Um, but that's going to completely break down because you'll suddenly have way more players with peaking capacity, and that's probably going to destroy pricing power in the market. So the the power market in Australia has worked this out that it, it, you know prices are going to be so essentially pinned by marginal cost of solar plus plus minus whatever spread a, a battery needs to make on a diurnal basis. So that's that's kind of a happy story. Mm -hmm. um, in oil and energy markets, it, it's it's. Honestly, it's the media coverage sometimes makes me want to scream. Um, the reason is it's very hard to observe China's uh, petroleum stocks because they don't like to report them. Uh, so they just they don't report them, frankly. So you can get it from satellite services for the above ground stuff, um, you know, and then for the below ground, I the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The uh, first rule about Strategic Petroleum Club in China is that you don't talk about Strategic Petroleum Club or you go to um, uh, maybe someplace in the far west of China. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of consultants have been harassed and left uh, China recently who used to provide that data. Um, but you can back it out econometrically just by sort of stock flows. And the funny thing is everyone talks about oil inventories being super low right now globally. But then if you back out this sort of accounting anomaly in China, um, we're probably at record stocks because China's been building its um, petroleum reserve like crazy during COVID and then more opportunistically um, since May. But then as soon as they stop and you get this once again out of more satellite or shipping tracking data, then the market kind of falls out of bed. So, so in a weird way, China's sort of been acting like a covert central bank of oil, um, uh, which is not 
very well and, and appreciated. Are they, trying to, are they trying to help the Russians? I mean, they're taking oil from the Russians. So, so yeah, so that, so that, so they've got a really interesting problem in the sense that they had structurally, um, and, and I would say, uh, yeah, structurally declining diesel demand because they moved a lot of uh, rail, a coal transport from trucks to rail. So of course, your unit diesel cost per kilometer goes down about seventy five percent. Um, and as a result of that, the diesel demand was declining, but then it's been going to the moon recently because they've been buying all this heavier Russian crude and running it, but their real estate sector is so sick, um, they're not able to use it. So my estimate is they're sitting on about 200 million barrels of diesel stocks right now, which is quite a lot. But then just a couple of weeks ago, they decided not to bump their quota for exports. So, uh, you know, as a, another destabilizing perhaps phenomenon, they're either... Um, they're planning to blockade someone in the not too distant future, or um, this is just really incoherent policy, which is not no, exactly. No, well, I think there are a lot of people who are afraid that they need diesel for yeah. reasons other uh, than their economy. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so and so one thing I've been mulling over as we model things like coal and uh, their grid build out, and you know, if so you have a lot of pumped hydro and a lot of distributed solar, then you don't need as much gas for peaking, so maybe the LNG demand falls quite sharply, um, is that, is that it's, it's very hard to read Chinese intent and they're often very dedicated to not making it easy for you to read the data. Um, so uh, it, yeah, it's, um, it, it, is, it is interesting, uh, occasionally profitable, but uh, um, not exactly easy work understanding if China moves to a further along in the transition and much faster, where the one stylized fact we have from Ukraine is that as soon as the shooting starts, uh, maritime transport comes to a halt because no one can get insurance, then that's actually a strategic advance, advantage to them in a lot of scenarios. So um, yeah, so I think about that as a markets guy because that seems like a one to two years sort of thing uh, or three years maybe. Um, but yeah, the longer run is, is, uh, it, is it, it's just, it is so volatile. It's um, it's very much crossing the river by feeling the stones. Well, so, uh, but one, of, one of their motivation for going green, quite honestly, was that the U.S. now has its own oil, right? That the United States had this big boom with shale and uh, we still have a thriving refining industry, you know, California market power, not to the side, you know, compared to, say, Europe, where you've had a lot of shutdowns and other places in the global south that always had refining shortages. So, you know, the question of, you know, uh, the strategy of green was to not, you know, was to get out of the sea lanes and, and be, you know, much more self-sufficient, right? That is probably part of why it's made it hard for them to commit to closing coal. And, um, and then the question is, I think you're, you know, asking the right question is if I'm building up all this oil um, and the United States has its own oil, um, you know, why did I feel I needed all that oil? I mean, I mean, they stockpile everything and they're generally honestly being great traders. Um, maybe not as good as Glencore, but close. Uh, um, I mean, the, they're stockpiling at a, at a high price oil. No, they think it's going higher. Oh, no, no. So, so you, they, they basically built most of their SPR over 2020 when transport demand imploded. Right. Yeah. 100%. Um, but I'm talking about then, recently because they've been stocking since May. Uh, well, then they completely uh, have stopped importing over the last three, four weeks. So they're clearly sort of, it's almost like a, a central bank managing a, yeah. uh, it's like, it's honest, it's like the Bank of Singapore managing like a, a trade weighted band for their currency. China's effectively got a band for uh, oil that they are very quietly um, enforcing, which I think is kind of a good thing from an inflation stability point of I view. Mean Standing back from this, could one ask the question, Tim posted this in the chat, and I know it's on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Are we basically saying that the demand side, the importing side, drives this industry over the medium to long run? I know you, you're, you're leery about talking about the medium to long run, but in these transition yeah. stories, it's the demand side that's really king, right? 
Um, it's all very well to have your own oil, Amy, but in a sense, it could just become a giant pile of stranded assets, especially especially if they're high cost, relatively speaking, compared it's to no, no question. Say again? Yeah. yeah. I, I think I think it's good to have your own supply. I think it's good to have stocks so you can manage price volatility. I mean, China does have a, has been actually significantly grown its oil production and gas production in the last couple of years. Um uh, quite extensively. So, I mean, but both are good things to have just to manage price. And also, and also the, the fact is a lot of these transition investments are quite long dated assets. I mean, uh, when farms got, you know, 25 years of cash flows, um, solar is much the same. So to the extent you can manage, you know, the cost of capital lower or more stably, that's desirable for, for uh, allowing the transition to occur. I think it, it's an interesting tension, though, that in the sense that if China's trying to enforce a ban on oil of, say, seventy to ninety dollars or thereabouts, and Saudi's spending to break even fiscally is, say, eighty-five to ninety to ninety-five, depending on how many um, strange oblongs in the desert you, they plan to build, um, that's that's an interesting tension, and it's also a question of if you are an oil exporter. How do you fund your transition to the next thing, whatever Saudi may want to export in 15 years, if you're being capped on your fiscal capacity by um, uh, by people managing the reserves in a different way? So th th there's lots of uh, funny national interactions that are occurring, which are perhaps not as well publicized as they should be. Mm. Um, yeah. I want to like spin around and ask about um, copper, because in the kind of news coverage of minerals and metals, I know lithium is like the heartbreaker and everyone, you know, expects it to make money and then you go bankrupt because somebody discovers another lithium thing. But putting together the comments about time horizons for investment and just the general coverage, if you look at the world through the lens of the FT or the Wall Street Journal, the vision that you get is of a looming issue in copper because the expansion of capacity has not been there. The existing mines in Latin America are you know, unpromising for political reasons. And the investment lags on these things are gigantic. They're, what, 20 years on you know, the, the Mongolian project. And um, if there's one thing we feel reasonably confident about is we're going to need a lot of it and recycling is only going to get us somewhere so how do is, is copper the you know allowing for the fact that in general we buy this yeah. stuff about market dynamics and innovation and recycling and everything else is 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 copper the acceptance of that story or is that is that another kind of fallacy of, of commodity journalism um, I, I, I think maybe, the, maybe Morgan, do you have a, do you have yeah, a, I think you, I was about to say, you should ask the actual yeah, Morgan, guy who's yeah, at the mining Morgan, school. <laughs> does Colorado have a view on, on copper? Well, um, yeah, look, uh, there, I, I think about all of these discussions in terms of, uh, priorities. So I'm going to try to start there and then come back maybe to copper. So time to, I spent quite a number of years working across the street from the IMF in, 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 uh, in the other building uh, related group. And, you know, what you see is that, uh, I, I guess I'm going to say something that's a little bit unsayable or that William alluded to the, 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 John Fosse, who just won the Nobel Prize in uh, Literature, apparently spoke the unsayable. So I'm going to say it this way, that uh, there's almost no country in the world where climate change is an actual priority, uh, where it's actually a, a political and social priority. It, it, there's almost no country where that exists today. You know, that, that might be argued by, I don't think so, by anybody on this panel, but maybe, um, sadly, I'd be right. And, you know, I think that that was, that was very clearly, it, it, it's become even more clear after, after the invasion of Ukraine, where 
you know, energy security takes this 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 higher plateau. And so, uh, but how you use priorities is important. And and if you don't have something prioritized, then you're not going to get very much done about it, at least from a public policy perspective, let alone an investment perspective. And so I think that the topic we're going around, if we call it something like energy security or security of energy and minerals or something like this, is that we can use the security imperative to do the things, to do the other things. So in other words, in some way, you can do the the, the right thing for the wrong reasons, maybe, or something like that, which brings in some kind of weird morality. But it, so when we think about minerals and critical minerals, the only reason they're being talked about, at least in the United States and to a large degree in other OECD countries, um, is because of the existing uh, trade war with China or the angst with China, whatever the, the, the most popular term is for it these days. It's, it's not because of some mid-transition struggle or some sort of uh, climate change uh, uh, um, imperative. And so it's become a priority for that political reason of China. And in the United States, of course, that means it, it's one of the only things that, that's actually remotely bipartisan. Uh, you, you can see that in, in, in the Congress if, if it were actually functioning today. But the, the, and so, you know, down to copper, um, sure, copper is very important for energy transitions. It's very important for electrification, especially. It also happens to be incredibly important for munitions. And so where you see priorities are where you'll see action. Um, is there some sort of dearth in, copper the, the the resource of copper no there's no dearth of resource of copper like almost anything these are rarely technical problems um but there are issues uh ha happening in countries that have copper um including the famous drc issue you know everyone talks about the drc in terms of cobalt of course cobalt is a secondary mineral you mine for copper not cobalt and uh, and we have problems in Peru, and there's issues in Chile, et cetera, et cetera, and issues in the United States, uh, and on and on. So, interestingly, um, copper was just copper is not on the United States Geological Survey critical minerals list. It is on this newer list that came out of the Department of Energy. Um, that doesn't mean it's more or less critical. Of course, it's 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 it's, it's critical and. You've had some famous energy people like uh, Dan Jurgen write reports with S and P about it recently. Um, will it halt the energy transition? No, it will not. Um, but people need to keep in mind in the back of their heads that some people are more concerned about uh, using copper for munitions than they are for transmission lines. And so I come back to that idea of priorities if you don't understand where the priorities are then you're very unlikely to come to a reasonable uh, answer or solution i take that i take that point um i think that's a that is a crucial thing it is somewhat sobering to sort of scan the world's governments and ask who in fact is taking this seriously um goes to a point we had in the q and a i see you william from nick buxton asking is there an energy transition happening or is there in fact just simply an energy expansion happening uh with new and added sources being thrown into the mix uh pell-mell william uh you wanted to you you were triggered by the priorities or by the copper copper um actually and i wanted to pick up on what you just said about energy uh symbiosis of the additive dynamics between energies and energy sources which i think is another big blind spot in, in these discussions. Uh, so I'll, and speaking, of course, under Morgan's control um, on, on copper, but I would nuance uh, the, the those remarks a little bit because as I understand it, Europe is very poorly positioned and independently of any trade and geoeconomic, geopolitical tensions between the US and China, uh, 
Europe faces a, a really uh, uh, steep challenge in terms of its critical mineral uh, situation. I, uh, I understand I have some numbers that I looked up recently that uh, Europe's supply of critical minerals contains only 3% of local production, and the target is to get by 10% by 2030 and to 40% of refining of metals uh, by, uh, by 2030 as well. So this is a, a huge challenge. And um, there is also uh, the, the fact that the EU taxonomy uh, doesn't include mine, does not include mining activities uh, and the related sustainable finance disclosure regulation uh, with you know, the implications for that regulation that, uh, that the EU taxonomy doesn't include mining activities despite the fact that uh, the technical experts group of the EU, the, the TEG, has included, um, has cited aluminum, copper, nickel, cobalt, lithium, lead, zinc, and precious metals as being essential for the transition. So there's a real contradiction there, I think, um, with you know pretty big ramifications. Um, and also, um, you know, the the problem of um, of permitting lead times, um, which is related, but uh, the, the EU has these very ambitious renewable uh, energy targets. But we know that onshore wind uh, or solar have four to seven year uh, lead times for permitting, and for offshore wind, it's it's more than ten years on average in Europe. Uh, so some very very big issues in terms. This is. Yeah, related but different from the the copper and critical mineral uh, issue, and I just wanted quickly to segue to the uh, issue you mentioned, Adam, about <clears throat> additive dynamics and energy expansion. Oh, also just one other point in terms of other regions, Africa, um, I, the lack of access to energy. So there's a lot of energy, of course, is needed to uh, produce uh, critical minerals. Uh, you know, at least at the extraction stage and. Um, energy consumption in Africa is 185 kilowatts uh, per uh, 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 185 kilowatt hours per year. This is Sub-Saharan Africa excluding uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa excluding South Africa, whereas in Europe it's 6,500, and in the U.S. Uh, uh, 12,500. And um, so there's there's really very as as Tim said at the outset about the lights not being on uh, in in, uh, in in parts of the world. Um, there's a real challenge of ac access to uh, energy and, and uh, electric power in Africa. So I'm you know it, this could be a, ma a major avenue for for Sub-Saharan Africa to diversify its export base with also the associated risk of a critical mineral resource curse that we talk about in our paper. Uh, but the, 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 I think there are, there are big challenges there too. And very quickly about this this issue of um, of symbiotic relationships, I think this is picking up also on uh, something Amy said um, uh, regarding EVs. I think um, it's important to to realize that copper is not just important for the energy transition, but it's part of the vitamins of the economy. And all these needs, if we continue uh, on the current trajectory of expanding. Uh, uh, consumption at the global level and, 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 and in, in gradually increasing income levels. Um, we're, this implies massive needs for copper for reasons independent of the energy transition. So I think we need to factor this in. And um, speaking of EVs, I, I think there are some big challenges that, um, that are kind of uh, being uh, sidelined in discussion. So uh, the CEO of Stellantis recently said that if EVs are not affordable, you can't leave a big chunk of the U.S. middle class without, you know, freedom to to move move around. So there's a big question of EV affordability, even more, of course, for uh, low income and lower middle income countries. Another problem on the EV side is the stability of the power system. So there are rumors that the uh, uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner, uh, reassured uh, uh, auto lob, uh, auto in, the auto industry in Europe by saying. Uh, that they would be able to export to um, to developing economies, but there's some pushback is that the grid may not be stable enough. Uh, putting aside the the question of affordability, um, and so um, just sorry, this is this is a bit uh, meandering, but just one last point on energy symbioses. I think Vaclav Smil uh, pointed this out um, in his book uh, on the history of uh, energy transition that a fundamental um, a fundamental fact of energetics is uh, that every transition to a new form of energy supply has to be powered by the intensive deployment of existing uh, energies and prime movers. So I don't think I think it's important not to underestimate the extent to which 
uh, coal is uh, is needed to produce steel, which is currently needed to uh, produce EVs and so on. There are all these very powerful symbioses. We may be able to decarbonize steel, but we're not there yet. Um, so yeah, let me stop here. So I, I want to address one more thing, Adam, for you as the historian, um, because part of the storyline of the Industrial Revolution then followed by the World Wars was that we had a giant amount of electric cars in the United States in 1910 and going into the World War I period. Um, and then there was a lot of metal that was needed for munitions, just as um, was mentioned about copper. Um, and it scuttled it. And, and actually, the Allies, because the Germans controlled the railroads, um, one of the big things that uh, the president did at the time in the United States was deploy uh, Ford Motor Company and other uh, other organizations to provide these gasoline trucks and chassis and change their assembly line from electric to fuel-based vehicles uh, mm -hmm. to facilitate sending those vehicles to help Europe. So um, a war could actually be, uh, if we history is any teacher, uh, a war could actually be a, a definitive feature in shuffling away from a technology if suddenly the war is taking up. I mean, I think Morgan raises a really unbelievably important point about, you know, what is your priority for uh, different materials and uh, how might that manifest itself in a war situation as opposed to peacetime? So if I'm trying to pull together the strands of this fascinating exchange, um, I mean, we started out with a kind of script, which was energy transition, we're in mid-transition, mid, mid oil demand falling, panel, tell us how you feel the world will be rearranged, assuming that oil demand is falling. <laughs> and what I'm hearing is uh, something different and more complicated, which is, um, uh, take picking up uh, Morgan's point, Maybe the energy transition is really no one's priority. The, the priority is some sort of great power competition logic. That's the priority. And energy technologies may play into this. Um, there's every reason to think the Chinese would, from their position in the world, have a substantial interest in diversifying their energy sources and stockpiling oil and minimizing their dependence on seaborne routes. And that's kind of one logic that's happening. But the way that Alex described it, it's not really a one-way street. It's not a, it's not an unwinding. It's actually a kind of strategic play between the Saudis and the Chinese, and that's what's going on. And then we have a kind of general skepticism about California, a warning about the fragility of Europe, and Morgan's point about how, well, really, when the chips were down, everyone clustered around fossil again. And then from William and from the chat line on the right hand side, a bunch of questions about the fragile states in between, um, who presumably actually have every interest in as far as possible preserving the status, the status, the status quo, um, because the, a bad as and complicated as that is, the world that comes next for many of them looks even more complicated. Mm. Um, and I don't know, does that seem like a more reasonable summary of where we've ended up after after Alex? But please, I mean, but because it seems yeah. like you drifted from a you know a crisp original setup to this this image. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, you're the historian, but I'm not sure state behavior and priorities really change much ever. Um, but I think what you throw a new technology in the mix, whether that's nuclear weapons or really cheap renewables and storage. And then that changes the lay of the land in terms of the priorities and edges countries can get. And, and also for consumers, I mean, I, you know, if you have solar and storage in Australia, you just basically stop thinking about your power bill because it's basically nothing. Um, that's quite nice from a consumer point of view, but for, for states, initially they sort of see this as maybe, well, trying to mostly just saw it as an export industry to a very heavily subsidizing Europe. But now at a certain scale, this starts to take on a security dimension. And similarly with, with, uh, with all this current trade 
uh, tension over electric vehicles is that if electric vehicles are something that people will buy and are a technology that exists at a reasonable price point, then it's really an issue of do you want to have an auto industry anymore? I mean, it's interesting going back to, I mean, why China did this is because China, I, I remember visiting Chinese auto companies in the a lot in the early 2010s, and they were, were and particularly companies like Geely, they'd worked out the only countries they could ex export IC cars to successfully were places like Russia. They really couldn't compete with the Toyotas and Volkswagens. And so they just said, all right, if we're going to be relevant, we have to go all in on EVs. This is sort of existential for us. Um, and there was definitely a good amount of state support too, but there was also a calculus that we're not going to have an export sector in this space otherwise. Um, and of course, they've exceeded wildly from there. So I think it's more that I'm not sure priorities really change that much. And I think Morgan's absolutely correct on that. But once these technologies get to a certain price points and availability, people have to deal with them and they have to sort of integrate them into their calculus one way or the other. So how bad does the climate crisis have to get before it actually, I mean, because William started very, you know, at one point reminded us in, in his comments that we're all losers unless something acts. Implicitly, what we're saying is that for all relevant purposes <clears throat> over the next 10 to 15 years for the big actors in the system, the climate crisis as such is is actually bracketed it's because otherwise as you were saying alex and morgan following on from morgan you know states priorities remain the same and by implication morgan or actually explicitly climate as such is kind of extraneous to that but yeah uh, Adam, if, if if i may oh i'm sorry alex no no go go ahead Morgan. no i i would say that the the the, the bad thing about climate crisis is that hydrological cycle intensification tends to destroy infrastructure the good thing about renewable technologies, they tend to be sort of anti-infrastructure to the extent that, I mean, the Panama Canal water levels are quite low right now. Shipping is starting to be constrained. Um, most global shipping is just moving around jewels uh, yeah. between dry bulk for coal and oil products and so forth. So in the, it, we're getting to this point where the, there's this real confluence between hawkish security people and people who care about climate because they're the things they want achieve their objectives Similarly, and so and I would just point out just quickly, Europe installed a giant amount of renewable energy. Adam, it was really not coal. The coal plants were only utilized six percent. Right? They they put in solar. The the rooftop solar in Germany added batteries. There was just a tremendous amount of hastening. They made announcements that they're going to quadruple their you know their targets for renewables. So I think the war really actually hastened. The transition, not the other way around. It just set back, you know, last year's emissions, you know, for some temporary uh, fixes. Tiny, tiny bit, tiny, tiny. Yeah. Bit. I mean, the story that 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 kind of fossil fuel reversion story for Europe just doesn't wash. It's, it's yeah, one hundred percent. So, so I feel like, you know, and and even for LNG, you know, the Indians. I've been working with the Indian government, and uh, they, you know, we had all these, you know, models we did for them for the green industrialization decarbonization planning. And they just said, OK, that's it. We're holding natural gas at 2%. We're not letting it go up. We don't want any more LNG. We're not out in the LNG market, right? But, because to, to but unstable. In, but in this case, green concerns, renewable energy concerns, and security converge. So it's not really a 100%. Test. That, that's my really point. Test. So Morgan's, Morgan's hypothesis becomes is more relevant when you ask the question of, you know, can the most progressive government in Europe ask, you know, get serious about heat pumps? And the answer is, Panic stations, in fact, it's very difficult because that's a that is concerned. But um, Morgan, you wanted to come in. Well, well, just to 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 say, I, I liked how Alex just said that, and and Amy. So, what, what Alex said there at the end um, about you know there was this convergence of, of of interests that that made a happy thing. You know, that's why you see the DOD in the United States, the military in the United States talking about climate and security, that there's a nice convergence to, to different interests. And, and what um, Amy said, of course, is exactly right, that, you know, you asked, what will it take to take climate seriously? Well, war is one thing. And, but I think to go back to my point there, we can use these paradigm shifts in things like that people really care about as top tier priorities like security, like 
air and water pollution and like economic development as prime um, motivators that will help the climate as well. And so you, you, you can get some of these happy coalitions, but if you insist on transacting everything through a climate lens, it is, in my view, not the most powerful nor the most effective way to make those transitions. Yeah, this is a kind of Navros Dubash uh, view of of um, and, and climate politics worldwide, right? There are there are some constituencies where you may actually be able to sell climate head on, but in the vast majority of places, it's got to be in combination with exactly as you put it, like either pollution or 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 cheap energy or development. Those are the or national security. Those are the kind of it's got to be coupled. Um, Right. This has been a really, this has really been a quite sobering, but absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, it's made me think much harder about the mid in mid transition. Um, it's made me much more fascinated in Chinese stockpiling and the on the oil market. And I'll be thinking of you, Alex, when we see the oil price gyrating um, where it's at and wondering who's in the background there. Um, it's been really fascinating to hear this range of views from oil to minerals. And I just want to thank again the, the audience for being here and the um, Giant Family Institute and the entire team at Phenomenal World for putting this together. It's been a privilege and uh, fascinating. And I think um, we should all go away and read, uh, at the very least, uh, William and his team's paper on the mid-transition. Um, thank you very much for taking part. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again on some other uh, some other phenomenal world event. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks all. everybody. Just Great bye. panel. William, Just I'm going to run and get your paper right now. <laughs> Me Looking too. Quite so. Thanks, Thanks. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everyone. Yeah, we'll, we'll have the transcript out for you guys to review in a few days and then try and put it up. Um, uh, Jack, we are off, right? No, we're still live.